worship we've enjoyed together and truly to emphasize the fact that Jesus loves us is a great theme to start out this year. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to go ahead and be turning to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel. We're going to start today a study through the book of Daniel verse by verse. And if you have a title for it, I'd give this title, Daniel, the Miraculous and the Mysterious. Daniel, the Miraculous and the Mysterious. And I'm here to tell you, if you enjoy anything about the Bible, you'll enjoy this study in the book of Daniel. If you enjoy hearing about God's miracles and the great things that God does, there are plenty of miracles that are located in the book of Daniel. If you enjoy seeing God just kind of show out and the fact that He's in charge of everything and He can show all nations as well as all rulers that He's in charge if He needs to, you'll enjoy it because God has a way of doing that in the book of Daniel. If you enjoy the end time experiences, the prophecies regarding the end time and all the events that are going to happen regarding the tribulation and the second coming of Christ, then you will enjoy the book of Daniel. I'm just here to tell you the book of Daniel is a powerful book and one that we are going to wade through and one that we're going to look at and seek to allow the Lord to speak to our hearts and minister to our lives. If you enjoy history, you're going to find out that Daniel ties history together with all those things that you learned about in Western Civ, how all that ties together from a biblical perspective. As we begin, I want to just begin to talk to you about some introductory statements about this book. We'll try to get to verse 1, but these are important things that you'll need to know and write down regarding this book of Daniel. First of all, it is a book of miracles and mysteries. A book of miracles and mysteries. For instance, some of the greatest miracles that we ever record and is ever recorded and that we teach our children are found in the book of Daniel. A lot of people don't know that. For instance, like the miracle of the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the fact that they stood against uh, Nebuchadnezzar and they were thrown in the fiery furnace and God preserved them is found in the book of Daniel. Of course, that story of Daniel, whenever he prays and had been restricted from praying, but he goes and prays anyway, and he's thrown in the lion's den, well, that's found in the book of Daniel. Not only that, if you'll remember that story about the handwriting on the wall at Belshazzar's feast, that handwriting where God writes on the wall and brings judgment against that king, that happens in the book of Daniel. Or if you remember where a powerful king named Nebuchadnezzar had pride within his heart, And God told him that for seven years he would act like an animal and he actually lost his mind. He became a madman and he acted like an animal for seven years. For seven years. And after the seventh year, he was restored to his health and he repented before God and humbled himself before Almighty God. That story is recorded in the book of Daniel. What I'm simply sharing with you is a lot of those stories that we have given over to children and we talked about in Sunday school. Those stories, the miraculous power of God is recorded in the book of Daniel. Not only though is it about miracles, it's also about the mysterious, a mysterious aspect of it. There's a profound interest in the book of Daniel about the future. At first it begins regarding the future events that are going to happen after Nebuchadnezzar's reign, the Babylonian reign, and who all is going to reign and how many kingships and kingdoms there's going to be. But not only is it regarding those future events, it comes all the way down to the future events of the end times that we are still waiting to see fulfilled. When we hear words like the rapture and the tribulation and the second coming of Christ, all of those things are put in a backdrop of the book of Daniel. If you're going to study prophecy and you're going to focus on the book of Revelation, the only way that you can adequately understand the book of Revelation is you have to put it with the backdrop of the book of Daniel. What I'm simply sharing with you is that Daniel's prophecies and all those things of the mysteries of the coming events, that was revealed in the book of Daniel. So the book of Daniel deals with certainly the miraculous. It also deals with the mysterious. An interesting thing about this book that's different from most books, it's actually written in two languages. In two languages. It's written in the Hebrew language, part of it, and the other part is written in the Aramaic language. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. The Hebrew language is written in chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, through chapter 2, 
4a, half of 4. All of that written in Hebrew. Beginning with chapter 2, 4b, the second part of that verse, all the way through 7 is written in Aramaic. And then picking back up in chapter 8 through chapter 12, it is written again in Hebrew. Why would that happen? Well, some people will try to explain away the miracles of God. And they try to explain away the prophecies of God. And some people say, well, it was written at one time by one author and another time by a different author. And that author who wrote later, whenever those things had all been fulfilled, it really wasn't prophecy, but rather it was just the fact they were writing at a later time and telling what had happened. Well, I'm going to tell you, I don't buy into that. I believe that God is a miracle working God. He already knows what's going to happen yesterday and today and tomorrow. And he reveals through his prophets what's going to take place. I believe it was written at the same time by this man named Daniel. It was written in two languages for a very simple reason. First of all, it has two different audiences. In the first part and the last part of that book, the audience that he is speaking to are the Jews, the nation of Israel, specifically about the events of their life and the coming events of their lives. And in order to speak to the Jews, the acceptable language would be the language of the Hebrews. But whenever it comes to the middle part of the letter, from chapter 2, 4a, through chapter 7, his primary audience is not the Jews. His primary audience is not the nation of Israel. His primary audience are the nations, the Gentile nations. Primarily in that particular time would have been the Babylonians and the Medo-Persians. But the common language for the people of that day would have been the language of the Aramaic. And therefore, they used, he used Aramaic in order to communicate to those people and those nations the message that God wants them to hear and to understand. We come to understand that's no problem for Daniel because as you look at his life and the early training of his life, he was brought over and deported over into Babylon. And there for three years, he was taught the language of that land. And therefore, he certainly knew the Hebrew language. He was a Jew. And he also knew the language of the Aramaic because he had grown there and been trained under Babylonian rule. I think it's neat because the fact that God wants you and me to understand what he wants us to understand when it pertains to us. Amen? <laughs> when he wanted the Jews to know it, he spoke in Hebrew. When he wanted the nations to know it, he spoke in Aramaic. A third thing about the book that you need to write down, the book focuses on a man and his friends, the nation of Israel, and the ultimate rulership of God over all the nations. Now you need to write that down because you need to understand it. All of those things come into play. The first thing is that it focuses on a man named Daniel and his friends, primarily those three Hebrew friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it focuses on their lives and how they lived in relationship to their God. Now, I'm just here to tell you there are a lot of great characters in the Bible. A lot of wonderful people to mimic. But you'll have a hard time ever finding anybody better than Daniel to serve as an example to follow. Daniel is a godly, godly young man. When he's deported, he's only about 15 or 16 years of age. And even at the very beginning, he wants to make sure he does not sin against God by partaking of unclean food or drinking unclean drink. And he asks requests. He receives favor from God. He has this one desire in his heart, in his life, and that is to walk pleasing to God. Walk pleasing to God, to honor the Lord in all that he does and to be obedient to the command of God. Whatever God would command, that's what he wanted to do. No matter the situations or circumstances or the cost, he was going to follow God. And those three friends of his were just like him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we know all about their story, don't we? Whatever he says to bow down at the idol that he created, Nebuchadnezzar, and they refuse to do it. And then he threatens them and said, I'll give you another chance. And they said, we don't need another chance. We're not going to bow down. And, and, and Nebuchadnezzar said, what God is there who could save you from me? Well, that's pride, isn't it? God will help him realize that for long, what God there is. What happened? It doesn't matter to us. Our God is able to save us. But whether he saves us or not, we will not bow down. We will not break the law of God. We will not worship your idol. They, just like Daniel, were dedicated seeking the blessings of God, wanting the blessings of God. Now, let me tell you something. If you, if you get anything out of this book, if you get anything out of this study, please do not miss that. 
that all that matters in your life is that you individually will seek to be pleasing to God. No matter what the circumstances of life might be. No matter what you might think. These people are living in Babylonian captivity. They've been deported from their home. Didn't matter to them. They're going to serve God. They're going to worship God. They're going to bless God and they're going to be blessed by God. And oh, they were blessed by God. Right there in the midst of, of all of that, that heathenism and all of that sin, God raises them up. I mean, they find favor. They find favor with heathen dictators. Can you imagine that? They find favor, favor with heathen dictators to the point that they're appointed to be in rulership and leadership over the heathen nation. Not only that, they were able to see, Daniel was able to interpret dreams and see visions. And, and God chose him. What do you think God chose this man to reveal all of these prophecies to and to reveal all of this end time and future events? Why would God do that? Because he was a man who wanted to bless God. He wanted to do whatever God said. He wanted to be in the center of God's will. And God poured blessings on him. Let me tell you, if, you, if you've got a resolution to establish this year, just establish that resolution. I, I just want to bless God. I want to honor God. I don't want there to be anything between me and God. If there's anything that would stand between you and God, get it out of the way. Take it out of the way and be totally, absolutely obedient as God reveals to you. Be obedient to Him. And you know what God promises? And you need to understand this. I think we've forgotten it. God promises He will bless you. I will honor those who honor me. And if you'll claim that promise, my friend, listen, as you bless the Lord and as you make that a priority in your life, God will bless you no matter what situations or circumstances you have in life. And, and through all of this book of Daniel, please do not miss that. That it's a story about a man and his friends and their dedication to God. It's not only, though, about a man and his friends. It's also about a nation. It's the nation of Israel. Now I hope you understand that from the very beginning when God called Abraham and God established that nation that it is and has always been God's chosen people. There is a unique relationship between God and the nation of Israel. You need to get that in your heart. Now I'm thankful that I'm a Christian. And I'm thankful that there's a time when we Gentiles can get saved. Amen? And I'm thankful that Jesus died for all of us. But I want you to get into your heart and your mind that before Almighty God, that nation of Israel is very, very precious. And whenever God considers time and when God considers history and God considers the events of everything that's happening, His focal point is going to be on that nation. It's always on that nation. And here's the thing about that nation. That nation has been rebellious to Almighty God and God has punished them when they've been rebellious. But God punished them because He loved them and because He cares about them. But God is not done with them. God has a plan for them and God is going to fulfill His covenant that He established with Abraham. And eventually all of that will come to pass. And this book deals with this nation of Israel in some horrible, difficult circumstances that it had moved into that even continues to this day, that even continues to this day, moved in because of their sin before a holy God. Now, you got to understand something about that, and that is this, that God is serious about sin. He's serious about sin. He's serious about the nation of Israel's sin. He's serious about your sin. He's serious about sin. But God deals with the nation of Israel, and the whole book... Of, of Daniel is focusing on this nation and how it is the focal point of God. Third thing, though, he reveals the rulership of God over all the nations, over all the nations. It's going to outline for you through some of the dreams that are interpreted and visions that are seen. It's going to outline to you some things that are, that are unique and the fact that it's going to talk about and it's going to talk about how all the nations are going to be used by the hand of God. In other words, those Gentile nations, God's going to raise up Nebuchadnezzar to use Nebuchadnezzar for a season, and, and then he's going to raise up Cyrus to accomplish something for a season, and, and then there's going to be the Greeks, and there's going to be the Romans, and he's going to tell everything that's going to happen to all of these different kingdoms. 
through just a, a, one particular dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And he said, I don't understand it. And Daniel was able to know the dream, understand it. And he told him there's going to be a kingdom. You're the first. There's going to be four kingdoms. And ultimately, after the fourth kingdom, there's going to be a final kingdom. And that kingdom is the kingdom of God that will last for all eternity. I don't know about you, but that tickles me to death that God knows about that. Amen. And I'm so excited that he could reveal that before it ever happens. And he's talking about things that people cannot comprehend. What's God saying? God's saying, I'm in charge. I'm in charge. And all of these things that I'm doing and how it's working is that I use these nations and I use their rulers to accomplish my purpose. And I will let them eventually know that I am ruler and that I am over them. And he does that throughout the book. At some point in time, some fall and repent. I think have a relationship with God. Others in their pride are killed in the night because they have pride and they desecrate the things of God. But the truth of the matter is this. You don't have to worry about God. He's in charge. You don't have to worry about all the nations and all the things that are going to be happening in the world. You don't have to be concerned about all those things. You know why? Because he's still absolutely, totally, without a doubt, in charge of every one of those events. And he's in rulership today. If you find yourself anxious about the situations and circumstances we find in life, you don't have to be worried about it. God's not worried one time. He knows he's still in charge and he's moving things towards an end to bring that to pass. It is a book, a fourth thing though, that deals with history and prophecy. And I want to emphasize that again. It deals with history and prophecy. How many of you remember going to your Western Civ class? How many of you went to Western Civ? I see those hands. Do y'all not know you went to Western Civ? If you went to college, you had to go to Western Civ. And if you went to college, went to Civ, well, maybe in your high school you studied it. But all kinds of things about the events that happened over in the Western civilization, whenever time started and history began and all those things. Well, here's a neat thing for you. If you like history, many of those same names that you read about in Western Civ, those same names are found here in the book of Daniel. If you've ever read about a king named Nebuchadnezzar, that's not just a Bible name. You can read about it in Western Civ. He was the leader and the king, the most powerful king of the Babylonian Empire. You can read about him. You ever heard of the king Belshazzar? You read about him. You heard about the Medo-Persian king named Cyrus who came into rulership, who overthrew the Babylonians? You read about him. You read about all of those people in history that are happening, those things that are happening in history that you read about in Western Civ. But here's the difference, and you need to write down this difference. It's very important. You'll understand this will be an aha experience for you. If you've never really thought about it, this will be an aha experience for you regarding helping you to understand Western Civ and how it ties. You ever notice in, in my Western Civ class, nobody ever talked about Israel very much. They ever talk about God and his people and the Jews. and not, If you had one, you were blessed. Most of mine never talked about that. It was all about all the other nations. Why? Because in history, the focus when you read in Western Civ was about all the nations. All these nations and who the powerful nations were. And the only thing that Israel was on that map was a little strip of land, a little strip of land that served as a crossroad for all those nations whenever they're conquering each other. It just becomes a crossroad, back and forth. Who's going to be ruling now? Well, it's at one time, it's the Babylonians, and, and then it's going to be the Medo-Persians, and then Alexander the Great comes along. And after Alexander the Great, it's the Roman Empire. And every one of those put Israel under its control. And it was just a, a, a spot in the road for all the nations. For all the nations. But it's different in the book of Daniel. It's different in the Bible. For the focal point is not the nations. The focal point is the nation of Israel. The focal point is the nation of Israel. And everything is related to how it affects the nation of Israel. And the reason the Babylonians are identified is because they were Gentiles who first took over the nation of Israel. 
And then the Medo-Persians are controlling the nation of Israel. And then Alexander the Great controls the nation of Israel. And then the Romans control the nation of Israel until finally and ultimately God's going to establish his rulership over and once again the nation of Israel. The focal point is always about the nation of Israel. Jesus spoke to that. You can read it when you get home. Write it down, Luke 21, 24. Luke 21, 24. When he talks about the judgment in the end times, he talks about this. He says, these are the times of the Gentile nations. The times of the Gentile nations. You know what that means? That means that there was a specific time that God knew that his nation, Israel, was going to fall under the rulership of the Gentile nations. And it was under that rulership because it was the judgment of God upon them and the failure of them to be the people of God. And the nations were going to rule over Israel in that time. But then there will come the end of the Gentile nations' time and rule. And God will reestablish that rule. And God will win his kingdom. And God will establish his nation. But you're going to be able to see that as it ties to history and all those events. And I'm here to tell you, we're so blessed because we live where we live. Because it's a book of history, but it's also a book of prophecy. It's a book of prophecy about things that were going to happen from, from whenever God told Daniel the things that were going to happen until the events and on out beyond us. It's a book of prophecy about things that were going to happen in his day and in and hundreds of years after his day. And then things are going to happen that we are yet to see. But here's a great thing about the book of Daniel. Over half of the prophecies that were foretold in the book of Daniel, he wrote it 2,500 years ago. Over half the prophecies that were foretold that would happen have already taken place. They've already taken place. It's already happened. You can just follow it through history. The pictures are going to be there, the descriptions, you can't miss it. It's through history that every one of these things, all of those nations that he foretold from being Babylonian, Medo-Persians to the Greeks all the way to the Roman Empire rule, every one of those things were pictured and given and interpreted and laid out and every one of those things have already come to pass. Now, why does that bless me and how should it and why should it bless you? For this reason, I think we can bank on it if all those other ones happen. We can bank on the fact the future is going to happen too, amen? <laughs> he didn't miss a thing. What God told him was going to happen has taken place, and what will take place and will happen is going to be something you can bank on and you can know. Final thing, though, I think we need to know as an introduction to this book, we need to know that this book teaches us things about God. It teaches us things about God that we need to know, we need to be reminded of few of those things. First of all, that God is a covenant-keeping God. When God made the covenant with Abraham, he is going to continue to work with the nation of Israel, preserve the nation of Israel, watch over the nation of Israel, and bring to consummation the fulfillment of that prophecy and that pledge and that covenant that he made with Abraham. I'm glad to know that I serve a God who's a promise-keeping God. That whatever he promises, he will do. Even when the nation is rebellious, even when the nation turns its back on God, even when that happens, he's still going to keep his covenant. Another thing is, he's an all-powerful God. If you ever have worries, it's because your God's not big enough. Did you know that? I mean, isn't that true? Think about that practically. If our God is big enough and our God is powerful enough, is there anything too big for God? Is there anything that we need to be worried about or concerned about in things about that? We have problems that God can't take care of. The answer is no. If he's an all-powerful God, well, if there's one thing that this book will help you understand, he's an all-powerful God. He's an all-powerful God. One of my favorite stories in all the Bible is, is the three Hebrew children. I mean, I love the way it's written. You know, it's, it's going to throw it in the fire and the soldiers get burned up from throwing them in there and they come out, their clothes are not burned. They don't even smell like smoke. That's pretty good preservation, wouldn't you say? 
What I love about it is whenever these prideful Gentile rulers think they're in charge and God reveals he's in charge and that God's in control. And he is always and has always and will always be in control. He is all powerful. And if you don't come through the book of Daniel studying that and you realize how powerful he is, then you're going to miss out on a great truth. He's not only that, he's sovereign in his rulership over the nations. He moves human history towards its final consummation. He's holy. He is holy and he expects his children to obey his word. You're going to find out when we first start out, you're going to be amazed at some of the things you're going to find out about the history of Israel. For instance, how many years were they, how many years were they in exile in Babylon? How many years were they in exile? 70 years. Exactly, 70 years. God foretold how long they would be in exile. Did you know that? God foretold. But there's a reason that they were in exile for 70 years. That's not a random number. There's a specific reason why they're in exile for 70 years because they had failed to do something that God had commanded. They had failed to do something God had commanded and God told them that you're going to be in exile for 70 years because of that sin. Now that lets us know this. God is serious about sin. He expects us to be obedient to him. And we need to understand that God's serious about sin, not just in Israel's time. He's serious about sin in our time. And God expects us to be obedient. How serious is sin? Sin is so serious, it cost Jesus his life on the cross. That's how serious sin is. How serious should sin be to you? It, paid, it was paid for by the precious blood of the Lamb of God. And there should be nothing in our lives that we say, that's okay. That's acceptable. That's just a small sin. That's just a little thing. I'm here to tell you, my friend, whenever you get into the mindset that you think any sin is acceptable and you do not realize as serious as any sin in your life, then you're going to fall under God's judgment and you're going to have to be disciplined by the almighty God who loves you just as much as he loved Israel, who loves you, but because he's holy and he's righteous and he's true to his word and he's true to his commands and he's true to his punishment, whenever you don't take sin seriously, it costs you. It will cost you. And the nation of Israel through the book of Daniel is coming to understand that all these things that are happening and all that is taking place is because they did not take their sin seriously when God did. When God did. Now, so you don't think I'm going to forget totally, I'm going to read one verse. I'm going to read one verse for you. This is what it says. And the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. I'm here to tell you, that one verse tells you so very, very much. Jehoiakim was the king of Judah. He had followed his righteous father, Josiah. Josiah was a righteous, godly king who tried and sought to restore Judah back to serving God faithfully. Now, do not miss out on that. Do not miss out on that. Because you have to understand this. Daniel and his friends, when they were deported, they were under the first deportation. There's actually three deportations out of Judah over to Babylon. The first was in 606. This is whenever he goes. The second is in 597. And the final one was in 588 or 587. Three deportations by Nebuchadnezzar. He happens to be in the first one. He was probably about 16 years old whenever he went, 15 to 16 years old, whenever they took him. But you know what it means? Go back and look in history. It means that he grew up, he grew up under the leadership of King Josiah. The righteous king. The one who was seeking to restore righteousness within the nation. He and those other three Hebrew children, and I know, do not know how many more. These are just the ones recorded. All of those had grown up under a righteous king who had sought to serve God faithfully. And isn't it amazing? 
And whenever they find themselves deported all the way into a foreign country and over in Babylon, you're going to find out that they want to live righteously. And they want to serve God. They want to be obedient to God. You know why? Because when they were growing up, somebody was a righteous king who taught them righteous things. And those righteous things became a part of their life and made a difference in their living and how they serve God. Wait a minute. He grew up under a righteous king, but when Jehoiakim was that king, he was not a righteous king like Josiah. And now had come the time for God, as God had foretold, for God to discipline his nation. In order for you to understand that, I'll give you some prophecies to read. Read these when you get home. Isaiah 39 Verses 5 through 7. Jeremiah 25, verses 8 through 12. Jeremiah 27, 6 through 8. And Jeremiah 29, 10. These are prophecies that Isaiah and Jeremiah spoke. Isaiah lived in 700, 700 B.C. These events are happening in 600 B.C. Jeremiah lived in the first part of the 600 B.C. Two prophets who had foretold what was going to happen. Isaiah specifically says this to Hezekiah. Hezekiah, in your day, it's not going to happen, but it's coming. The king of Babylon is going to come. There's going to be somebody who's going to come and going to take away all your treasury. They're going to take away your kids, take away your sons, and take them into their leadership role. And Jeremiah's prophecy that I gave you, he doesn't just say it. He names who is it going to be. It's going to be Nebuchadnezzar who is going to take and take your children and take them away from you. And take all of your pride. Jeremiah names the name. Jeremiah not only named the name of the one who's going to take them, he also eventually names the name who's going to set them free and let them come back. His name was Cyrus, who was a Medo-Persian king, who's going to serve years, years later. See, God knows everything. But in those prophecies I want you to read, you'll find out it tells why, it tells why they have to go and how they're deported and why they're in exile. I'll let you read that. We'll be talking about it next week. But there's a reason. There's a reason because the nation of Israel did not believe the law of God, did not abide by the law of God, and had not done it for years and years and since the kingdom had been established until this time. And God finally said it was enough and that you're going to have to be judged. And what you did not do, which if you would have done, I would have blessed you, but which you did not do, now will be done, not because you chose to, not because you were obedient, but it's going to be done because I am judging you. Read it. It's in there. I want you to come tell me that next week before I preach. You should tell me, hey, I know what it is. Then I'll let you preach if my voice is like it is this week. <laughs> Study it. Find out everything. That one verse tells us this. These are deported. There's a reason for that. There's a time for that. There's a timeline on it. And God is going to be carrying out his work. God's going to reveal his power. God's going to show himself. And right in the middle of that, God used a man named Daniel. I don't know about you. I'm excited about it. Excited about the study. Excited about learning. I've studied and preached through the book of Daniel. I've preached sermons about Daniel. But the first time in my ministry I've ever taken from verse 1, I'm going to go all the way to the end with Daniel. And so we'll get together and, and we'll walk together. You're going to get hip deep. Some of you are going to be Swimming for long. Whenever we get into that, it's going to be there. But I promise you, I believe under God, he wants us to know that. I believe he wants us to be challenged by it in regard to history, prophecy, and everything else to challenge our lives to be the people that God wants us to be. Let's pray together. <laughs> You're right, brother. <laughs> thank you, Lord, for the fellowship. Thank you for the word, and thank you for truth that you speak to us. And I just ask that the Holy Spirit would challenge us. Challenge us, Lord, to be those godly people like Daniel and the three Hebrew children. Challenge us, Lord, to be serious about sin and to learn the lesson that the nation did not learn. Help us to realize you're powerful and almighty God. We can rest in you. And help us through it all, Father, to be drawn to a closer walk with Jesus. Thank you that the ultimate fulfillment of everything that Daniel's going to say is when he talks about the kingdom of Jesus kingdom of the Son of God and all that He does and how He blesses. Friend, today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I encourage you to give your heart to Christ. We haven't talked about the gospel today. We just talked about the Word of God. But I can tell you, in that Word, it'll tell you you need to be saved. You need to give your heart to Christ. 
And without Jesus, there is no hope. And if you've never given your heart to Jesus, would you do that today? Would you say yes to him? Would you come commit your life to Christ? What about you, child of God? As you begin this new year, you're going to commit your life afresh and new to walk and to be blessed and to be a blessing, to seek to honor God in all things, to not let there be one thing between you and your Lord. Make that commitment. Ask him to help you to do that in your life. Maybe you've been praying about a church home and God's spoken to you that he wants you to be a part of the Parker family. We invite you to come. Love to have you be a part of our family. And if he speaks to you, you respond. You come. Maybe there's a burden on your heart. You need to come and cast before the Lord. We ask you to do that. But whatever God has, you do in this time of invitation.